welcome to all of you. And for the last time in 2001, I say that. Hello. Hello to all of you, and welcome to today's teleclass lecture, COVID-19 Pandemic Dress Rehearsal for Disease X, with a question mark at the end. And today we are in for a treat. Our speaker is Professor Stephen Morse. Now, as you can see on the title slide, he is Professor of Epidemiology at the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. Professor Morse came to my attention many years ago when I read his book titled Emerging Viruses, uh, which incidentally was selected as one of the top 100 science books of the 20th century. He is an advisor to many governments and international organizations on the epidemiology of infectious diseases and how to improve disease early warning systems. He was the founding chair of a nonprofit organization called PROMED, which stands for Program to Monitor Emerging Diseases, and was the originator of PROMED Mail. I suspect just about all of us subscribe to PROMED Mail. If you look up Professor Morse on Wikipedia, you'll find out just how accomplished he is for such a young man. It has been my honor to know Stephen Morse for almost two decades. He gave his first teleclass lecture in 2004 on infection control and the bioterror threat, which he reminded me this week was a lecture that he had to present from an airport lounge where he was stranded because of flight cancellations. Professor Morse is a super nice person, and I am delighted to welcome him back. COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2 pandemic Dress Rehearsal for Disease X. Steve, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, and, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's truly an honor to be here um, and to celebrate the 20th anniversary of this wonderful series. And I could say the same to you, Paul. You're truly a wonderful person, I think, who's done a great service for all of us. Like ProMed Mail, we started out, ProMed started out, in the 1990s, actually, with very primitive, seven-bit ASCII, as we called it, email, simply because that was what we knew everybody in the world, if they could get email, and we had to help some of them get onto email, could receive. Similarly, I see that we're still using a universally available technology, um, which I think is very refreshing. This is one that everyone can can get on to and learn from. So it's really a, a privilege and a pleasure to be here. And as the next slide shows, congratulations, Paul, on the 20th anniversary of the teleclass. Uh, the next slide, just simply, you may wonder, what do I mean by disease X? Well, in the uh, shortly after the last Ebola outbreak, the rather large one, not the last one, but the large one in 2014 in West Africa, the WHO, having realized, I think, for some time that there were always going to be surprises out there, especially among what I called emerging infectious diseases, and I'll come back to that a little bit later, um, but they realized that there was really a need to try to plan in advance and, and have a priority idea, at least, prioritize what to look for and what to plan for. And so uh, since 2016, I think they've been doing this review of diseases prioritized under their research and development blueprint. And one of their original lists in 2018, as you can see, had a number of them. And at the bottom, there is one called Disease X, which was the unknown and unexpected. In other words, the one that wasn't on the list. Um, and in, in fact, we've gone through these periods of perhaps feeling successful and then being rapidly wrenched back to reality. Uh, so after the uh, eradication of smallpox, I think there was a feeling of triumphalism. And earlier than that, there was a feeling of triumphalism in the 50s and 60s against infectious diseases, that they were a thing of the past. And I, only, I think we all only wish this were so. 
And uh, we've been guilty at times of complacency, which is understandable because many of the most feared infectious diseases of the past uh, have been essentially controlled, many of them through vaccination, which is why they're called vaccine preventable. And that's a very important point that I don't need to emphasize to this audience. And so just before this uh, last pandemic, there was actually um, uh, an, an evaluation of the global health security uh, posture, how prepared was every country for some kind of emergency, like a, a pandemic or an infectious disease outbreak. And as you can, say, as you can see, the U.S., Australia, and a few others in Europe, for example, came out at the top of the list. Um, unfortunately, uh, the truth for this uh, was very quickly discovered when this particular pandemic came upon us. Now, the next slide, you know, simply says when we talk about dress rehearsals for disease X, uh, we actually have had dress rehearsals for disease X. And I'm going to talk about that because there have been numerous dress rehearsals, none of which apparently um, have been sufficient to prepare us for the reality. And so, for example, just to speak about the most recent ones, the, the next slide, slide six, uh, talks about crimson contagion, which was reported in the press shortly after um, the beginning of the pandemic. And it was essentially an exercise carried on just before the pandemic started by the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, by people, actually, people like Bob Cadlick, whom I know well for many years, and who really were very attuned to these uh, concerns and very knowledgeable. And many people in CDC and elsewhere in government in the U.S. who certainly had been through a number of pandemics, like the 2009 H1N1 flu pandemic, and certainly knew what they were doing and knew what to expect. And so there was this exercise, Crimson Contagion, going on throughout the government and in a number of states, including Illinois and, and others, to try to test out our, our capabilities. And of course, we always learn that communications and the chain of command turn out to be the most important things, just simply knowing whom to call and how to um, appropriately get everyone involved and how to communicate. Uh, and all of this uh, came up during the Crimson Contagion exercise shortly within government shortly before the uh, pandemic. Um, in the civilian sector, if you will, the next slide refers to event 201, uh, which was carried out by the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, which uh, for those of you who may be, as old, may be not quite as old as I am, I'm 70 now, so thank you for calling me a, a young man. Uh, I appreciate that. I, I'm told it's the new 50 or something like that. Um, but those of you who remember smallpox eradication in the early days uh, may remember D.A. Henderson, who spearheaded this for the WHO, and Bill Fage, of course, on the CDC side, both uh, you know personal public health heroes of mine. And um, this center was actually started by D.A. Henderson when he returned to Hopkins as dean some years later. But uh, it's, it's grown, the center has grown since then and carried out this Event 201 exercise in October of 2019. Ironically, in New York City, it was essentially a tabletop exercise, very well produced. There's a link there. You can see all the data. And because people, I guess, were tired of talking about uh, the endless flu pandemic, and of course we'd had the smallpox um, exercises and scenario earlier, as, as Paul referred to a, a talk I gave uh, in one of the early years of this uh, teleclass series, uh, they decided to try a coronavirus because obviously that had pandemic potential as well, which was well known after SARS and Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS, which I'll tell you more about in a few minutes. And basically what all this showed, 
was was that there was still a lot to be done that needed um, to be fixed in order to be prepared for that next pandemic. But it was clear that we'd had these scenarios and scenario planning many times, including this just before the event. And the uh, second bullet here actually was their prediction of what might happen at, at the end. This was a fictional scenario. So there were actually more deaths in this scenario, thankfully, than in real life, although there were still many, many deaths with this pandemic, as you know, worldwide, an incredible number. But um, I think they were exactly accurate in saying that eventually it would continue uh, and at some point would probably become an endemic childhood disease, like all the other coronaviruses, I'm getting a little ahead of my story, that already circulate in the human population, which we know about. There are four that, that we know. And so for those of us who've been working in this area, it's certainly an interesting time to be an epidemiologist. This is a cartoon from the New Yorker showing that uh, some years ago even epidemiologists uh, could could be accepted in polite society. Usually uh, when I was invited to a dinner party and I would tell people I was an epidemiologist working on infectious diseases, back in the days when you could have dinner parties, that usually did a very good job of clearing the room very quickly. But, but um, uh, I think views have changed, so now we're uh, a little more in demand, if not um, at least on, on Zoom and, and remotely. Uh, one of my favorite quotes at the moment is from Ray Bradbury, the science fiction writer, who said, people ask me to predict the future, which is indeed what we are often asked to do as epidemiologists, when all I want to do is prevent it, which is indeed the purpose of public health, prevention. So I think that encapsulates very well our job. You know, we have to predict and we try to predict, and this has been extremely unpredictable because of the, actually, the vagaries of human nature more than uh, even of the virus itself. But prevention is really our primary goal, and unfortunately, sometimes very hard to realize. Slide 10, the next slide. Um, I just want to, you've already heard about emerging infections and emerging viruses, some, something that... Uh, I became interested in as a result of a, an innocent question from Josh Lederberg, who was then the president. I'm sorry to say he um, uh, left, uh, left us some years ago uh, and died, I think, in 2008 in a great loss to science and to all of us. We could certainly use his wisdom now. But uh, when I was at Rockefeller he, the University, he was the president of Rockefeller, and, and during the holiday party around this time of the year, asked me some innocent question. He never really asked innocent questions. But you didn't realize that until much later. Uh, they were really very profound uh, about some, some odd viruses that, that had been, um, we'd been uh, thinking about, and that got me thinking about emerging infections and where they came from, particularly emerging viruses, being a virologist by by training and, and perhaps bias. Um, and we can define emerging inf infections as those that are rapidly increasing in incidence, uh, epidemiologically, that means number of new cases, or geographic range. And very often, these are novel, previously unrecognized disease, disease X, if you will, or Ebola in 1976, when it was probably known to people in some African villages, but not yet known to Western medicine and, and the people who are most likely on this call. Um, many of these turn out to be not the Andromeda strain, as some people might have thought, and some even published coming from another galaxy, but really zoonotic, so from inner space, from other species. And this is now something that, that's been widely accepted but back in the 80s, it, it seemed somehow a little bit heretical. Also, the causes are often anthropogenic, or as Pogo, the um, cartoon character said, we have met the enemy and he is us, or it is us. Uh, that is to say, land use change, agriculture, live animal markets, 
and, and other things that we do, as well as travel and transportation, are often important in precipitating and spreading, if it can spread, an emerging infection. And some of these common pathways include wildlife contact, people being able to get infections from wildlife sources, hunting, uh, probably HIV came into the human population more than once, we think, looking at the, um, at the data from, in fact, the phylogeny, the family trees of the circulating HIV uh, viruses, and uh, probably came into the human population several times from chimpanzees and through hunting, very likely, people who were hunting um, and then slaughtering and selling the meat. So, of course, we refer to this in Africa and other protein-poor places as bushmeat. Those of us who are um, living in uh, well-resourced, wealthy countries, of course, would refer to this as game hunting, or venison, for example. Um, so this is really universal, uh, you know, it's just that, that obviously it's essential in places where protein is very hard to come by in, in these low-resource settings. Uh, live animal markets and food handling, uh, by extension, also, as you know and as you'll hear, are, are probably major routes also by which uh, a new infection can enter the human population or spread more widely. And then, last but by no means least, the uh, main focus of this particular series, healthcare settings. And so many infections, and I'll give you several, advantage, uh, several examples, spread through the healthcare setting simply because of what we might call lapses in IPNC, infection prevention and control. And so that is a very important thing that all of you are participating in by participating in this uh, teleclass, and, and that really is extremely important because it's still a need and an unfinished uh, agenda even today. Once um, a new infection or an infection enters the human population, uh, and perhaps gets to a slightly larger group of people where it might be able to have the potential to spread further. Luckily for us, many of them really don't do that. They, they may be asymptomatic and, and cause abortive infections. They may simply be um, stopped by our own defense systems, the innate and um, adaptive immune systems, which would prevent them from gaining a foothold. But a few do succeed, and we know what those are because we keep hearing about them, and, and you'll see more examples. If it is able to do that, a new infection, of course, then has opportunities to spread very quickly, as we've seen with uh, especially respiratory disease pandemics, but also others in uh, this increasingly globalized world. And the Global Aviation Network is simply, as shown here on slide 12, is simply one example of that. On the next slide, it turns out, as I mentioned, that many of these so-called new, novel, or emerging infections, more accurately, are actually zoonotic. And so um, our colleague Mark Woolhouse and, and, uh, in Edinburgh and his team have put together some numbers based on, on reports of uh, infections, and apparently in the last uh, 50 years, probably since World War II, when the conditions for emergence have increased with a, an increasingly globalized and, of course, uh, more ecologically changing world, we see that most of the newly emerged pathogens are, in fact, zoonotic, and you can tabulate that. And there are many events that occur all over the world. This is a map uh, that uh, our, our friend David Morens and Tony Fauci, I think everyone knows Tony Fauci. He's now become a celebrity, but he's certainly done excellent work, both with, you know, really impressive work, both with HIV, and that was very important in the, the early days of HIV and later PEPFAR and uh, in helping to 
educate people and get the word out about this pandemic. So he's really a great scientific communicator. Uh, and my hat's off to his communication skills. But uh, every, every year or two, when they have a new review, they put out this map, which simply shows that there are many emerging and reemerging infectious diseases um, appearing all over the world. I, I define a reemerging infectious disease as one that had been controlled, but then suddenly reappears. And to me, the usual reason is lapses in public health measures, such as an immunization program that has run out of money or mosquito control pro um, programs that have become victims of their own success so that the disease is no longer considered a threat and we back off on the program and guess what? All the diseases come back when the mosquitoes uh, return after the pressure is taken off the population. So they should be red flags that public health, uh, you know, really needs to be uh, given attention and resources, which is, of course, you know, one of the bottom lines that I'm going to advocate here. But I have to admit, you know, that's a bias, but I think I can demonstrate a, a scientific basis for that or a, an evidence base for that. Anyways, you can see there are many all over the world and new ones all the time. This slide, the next slide, number 15, simply shows pandemics in history, and there have been a number of them going back as, as far as you'd like. Certainly smallpox has a long history, the Black Death of the uh, 14th century, and, and still recurring, the bubonic plague still occurs in many parts of the world, and, and uh, in the U.S., in fact. Uh, in the Southwest, there are still occasional cases, about half a dozen to a dozen a year, uh, that were brought in in the late 19th century from Hong Kong originally. So um, many of these pandemics have simply settled down, if you will, and are no longer the pandemics they once were. In the case of the Black Death, which had uh, Yersinia pestis, the plague, which has had a tremendous effect both um, culturally and demographically, um, we know now, of course, uh, a great deal about how to treat it. So it, it can be, if it can be treated quickly in people who are infected, uh, it, it can be controlled, and we do know how to control it in other ways as well, because we understand the transmission much better even than they did in the uh, mid-20th or early 20th century. And there have been many others, the 1918 uh, pandemic, the so-called Spanish flu of 1918. We just uh, commemorated the 100th anniversary, if you will, of that great disaster, probably the greatest natural disaster in recorded history, with well over 50 million, probably well over 100 million deaths, many of them in young, healthy adults. Um, and uh, still the object of a great deal of debate, but uh, still an important historical reminder. And I'll come back to that because there are some ironic parallels. HIV AIDS, of course, was a, a great pandemic in our own lifetimes, at least in my lifetime, and still with us, although now it's controllable, and if we can sustain it, we might be able to at least eliminate it from the human population uh, temporarily, at least until it's reintroduced. But that requires sustaining the treatment and other measures we have now, especially in resource-poor settings. Cholera has been well known for many pandemics throughout history, uh, since the 19th century especially, um, although it, it, in its natural setting, in the Bay of Bengal, for example, it's much older. Uh, but the steamship, it said, helped to spread this around the world, and we've gone through essentially the seventh pandemic now of, of cholera, although with uh, improvements in water and sanitation, obviously it's not a problem in the U.S. or Canada. In most of uh, the world, it's still a problem because potable water is not so widely available. Uh, and that, I think, is a real irony. Of course, there have been several other flu pandemics. The um, 2009, most recently, 2009 H1N1 pandemic, uh, which 
It gave everyone the opportunity to go through, essentially, an actual pandemic that perhaps was less consequential than some of the previous pandemics, but had many of the same characteristics. Uh, it spread around the world very quickly. And of course, now we have airplanes and other ways for people to be able to move and the diseases, the infections, to be able to move much more quickly. And now we're dealing with the current pandemic of SARS coronavirus 2, which causes the disease called COVID, coronavirus disease 19, 2019. I'm sorry the terminology is so confusing, and I'm going to try to be very careful about that, because I think that's been one of the serious problems. And last time I checked, we had over 5 million deaths globally that could be um, attributed to uh, COVID-19. And we just reached the 800,000 mark in the United States at the same time as the first anniversary of having a vaccine. So I think there's a real irony there. I think we all remember uh, having seen pictures or heard about, if not, I'll remind you here, I certainly wasn't there, um, but um, it made a great impression on everyone, and so we all had heard about it in our various uh, courses. Uh, the great influenza pandemic of 1918. Here are U.S. troops in Kansas, where um, it, it probably, uh, you had probably the one of the major super spreading events uh, before they were sent out to um, fight in World War I. And you can see, you know, how many sick people there were. And many of these died. There are many graphic descriptions of, of the bodies being piled up like cordwood on, like any great pandemic. Um, you have also probably seen all of these photographs of, of the measures that were taken in 1918. We ridiculed that afterwards, people wearing masks and all this sort of thing. And just as we see today, people wore masks. They were much more compliant and much more worried then when they saw this pandemic, but um, very reluctantly. So they wore masks but um, they were very glad to take them off when they could, which unfortunately in the case of San Francisco, they were very careful in wearing of masks and avoided the first wave. Often, as you know, these pandemics, as we see here, come in waves. They avoided the first wave of 1918, threw away their masks or even mask burning parties and anti-masks mask leagues i wouldn't mention it except it seems so familiar today and uh, they had mask burning parties and what have you and they did that only to be hit by the more virulent second wave of the uh, 1918 flu uh, so they avoided the immediate but did not realize that there was more to come, and that's a cautionary tale for all of us. Slide 18 simply um, reiterates a point that I uh, have made here a few times and will continue to make. No pandemic or emerging infection has ever actually been predicted before its appearance in the human population. Um, I was uh, bold enough to say that in the Lancet review we did some years ago. But unfortunately, despite all of the dress rehearsals for the dress rehearsal, we have, um, unfortunately, uh, can now say we have probably not yet, I think it, it's safe to say we have, in fact, not yet ever stopped a pandemic either. So let me say a few words about the current pandemic, having provided really basically just the context of emerging infections and our prior history of pandemics. So they've been with us uh, throughout history. They've had great effects on us throughout history. And we spent a lot of time, especially since 9-11, 2001, which both of us, um, both the teleclass and my own uh, course at the Melman School in Emerging Infectious Diseases actually originated in 2001. But since 9-11, uh, we've spent a lot of time thinking about the possibility of how to respond to pandemics, which is one reason that I have to admit I was surprised 
the word perhaps is a little weak for my own feelings after working on this for so many years, uh, on how we could better prepare ourselves to prevent uh, the devastation and the upset caused by a pandemic, I was surprised and very disappointed to see that we did not seem to be any better prepared this time and went through many of the same things with some interesting twists. But of course, coronaviruses were really not on anyone's radar screen in human health before 2003. So slide 19 simply shows an electron micrograph of a coronavirus, or as Lord Peter Medawar and June Medawar, his wife, um, the late Lord Peter Medawar, um, wrote in a um, book, Aristotle to Zeus, the Dictionary of Biology, they define virus, a virus as a piece of bad news wrapped, in a, wrapped up in, a, in protein. And that's what it is here. This is the nucleocapsid, of course, the bad news or uh, single-strand RNA genome of, of the coronavirus uh, surrounded by its protective protein shell or capsid, but then also there's a membrane-like envelope around it, and inserted into that are the spike protein molecules, which are so important to the business of this uh, virus because they're, they include the receptor binding site that allow, will allow the uh, virus to get into uh, the target cell. And with coronaviruses, unlike flu, for example, it's fairly easy, actually, to predict the host range and tropism uh, of a coronavirus in fact. So um, I think that um, uh, this is an important point because one of the things we need to know, you know, obviously is, is is what can we do when we want to make a vaccine? And the spike protein is the obvious candidate. It's also essential uh, for the, the virus. So that, you know, is a very good candidate for uh, as an antigen. Sometimes it's hard to find good antigens. And of course, this wasn't really, as I said, on anyone's radar screen in human health. Uh, it had been around, uh, coronaviruses had been around for many years. They were known for a number of years and certainly first uh, characterized in the 1930s as veterinary concerns, uh, both in livestock and, and in uh, domestic animals. However, as well as laboratory animals, mouse hepatitis virus, for example. However, in human health, nobody really thought about them. And uh, there had been some coronaviruses that were circulating in the human population. We know of four now that circulate readily in the human population that have been in the human population for some time. The most prevalent, OC43, probably came to us from the cow, probably in the late 19th century. I thought it would have been much earlier, but that seems to be the best evidence from at least the genetic, the sequence-based evidence. Um, and these were discovered more or less fortuitously in the 1960s by June Almeida and, and colleagues. Uh, she gave the name coronavirus, in fact, uh, as as circulating human viruses associated essentially with flu-like illnesses and the common cold or cold-like diseases. So they were ubiquitous, they were circulating widely, there are four that we know about, and nobody really paid much attention to them because they were just another one of those many respiratory viruses that kept coming around. Uh, and, and, and bothering us during the so-called flu season, like resp respiratory syncytial virus, another one of those, the flu itself, and of course all the rhinoviruses, which are now officially enteroviruses, but, you know, we still, uh, you know, think of that, that group of viruses as, as one of the many causes of something like the common cold. And then something happened in 2003, uh, slide 20, uh, reminds us SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. This actually was announced to the world in a ProMed post uh, in 
around, I think this was the 10th of February, which went out to all the subscribers to ProMed and uh, all of those who might have picked it up elsewhere, uh, people in, in the press, for example, simply inquiring about a strange pneumonia that seemed to be killing people in South China. And would that people read their email more carefully? Um, I will digress a few minutes. Paul said some very kind words about ProMed. The original objective of ProMed in the early 1990s was, you know, simply that we knew there would be a concern about emerging uh, as well as existing infectious diseases. We had just had this uh, deep dive in the case of the conference I organized in 1989 at the National Institutes of Health on emerging viruses. We understood something about it, but there was still no effective uh, global surveillance system for uh, infectious diseases. We thought this was the WHO's job. Everyone except the WHO at the time thought it was their job. They've had their ups and downs, and this was one, one of their down periods, I'm sorry to say. Um, they have improved considerably since then, and I give them great credit for the great work they've done over the years, and I think we should be very mindful of that and the potential uh, that they have. However, we started ProMed essentially to network laboratories around the world who could uh, perhaps identify something when it first appeared. And in those days, the technology both for identification of pathogens and for communications were much different than they are today. Email was a very new, was a, a very painful thing. It had been around for a couple of decades, but was kind of a, a specialist thing that very few people outside of uh, the wealthier countries, and even there, had access to. So um, actually, the everyone around the world was somehow gotten on to email, and then we decided to make it open to everyone. And those of you who are subscribers will know. If not, you're welcome to subscribe, no charge. We will not. They will not sell your your name, your address, any personal information. No advertising and no government. Funding the idea is to be free and and un, as unbiased as possible. So since 1994, the email listserv and website have actually um, uh, acquired over 70,000 subscribers in at least 185 countries. Uh, and we got a backhanded compliment some years ago. To my great surprise, I was leafing through this book by. Um, Stephen Johnson has written many interesting books, but uh, this was uh, called The Ghost Map. I recommend it if you haven't read it. It's quite interesting, including some of the context of the period when the cholera was in London. Uh, and it's about Jon Snow and colleagues and, and the cholera in London. And uh, a strange compliment, and as I was leafing through the book, I came across this statement that uh, ProMed offers a day update on known disease outbreaks uh, flaring up around the world, including unknown diseases, by the way, uh, which is true, uh, and we continue, hopefully, to try to do that, or ProMed continues to try to do that. But he goes on to say, surely makes it the most terrifying new source known to mankind. I, I've uh, corrected the, um, uh, obviously, uh, gender there. But the fact is that uh, we probably have more terrifying news sources now, which shows you how the world is much simpler. This is slide 23, by the way, if you're following along on the slides, in 2006. So that was a kind of backhanded compliment, but, you know, certainly an indication of the job that was being done with even this, this very early technology. Um, the SARS outbreak was investigated um, it had caused about 9,000 cases worldwide, as you know, after a Big Bang event in Hong Kong, which was one of the few times we can actually find a single event, probably here, too, as well, although we haven't quite found it. We, we have the hope we might be able to. But for many emerging infections, think of HIV, we can't always find the initiating event. We think we could for the 2009 um, H1N1, a pig farm probably in Mexico. Um, for this 
SARS, the original SARS outbreak in 2003, it was from a live animal market, and in fact, it was from this very innocent-looking and, and quite harmless insectivorous bat that's also sold in these live animal markets. And this horseshoe bat happens to be a species very common, this species and others related to it, uh, in Asia and uh, around that region, sold in live animal markets in places like China, but also as it happens, the host of natural host of many coronaviruses. And indeed, there are many coronaviruses in nature, many of them in bats and some of them in, in other uh, vertebrate species or vertebrate uh, uh, families as well. So uh, you can see that um, this innocent bat carries many viruses, as we all do as part of its natural um, collection of, of microbial uh, fauna, if you will, of flora, and it just so happens that the SARS coronavirus was one of them and happened to be able to get into the human food chain through and, and into human contact through these live animal markets. But the other thing that's uh, of interest is that when people were aware of this, they found this out by sampling a number of different species and going backwards, you know, from the cases that had been found in Hong Kong and elsewhere. And remember, most of the spread of the original SARS was through the healthcare setting. So that's why infection prevention and control still remains extremely important as a first line or as a line of defense. And this is true of many of the infections. So I'll continue saying that. But, you know, please keep that in the back of your minds as I talk about all, all these other narratives. So they sampled this, um, these, these bats, and they found that they contained not only this particular coronavirus, but many other related coronaviruses that had similar receptor specificities for the, um, some of them even better suited to uh, human infection with, with uh, spike protein receptor binding domain that was even more closely um, connected to or better able to attach to human receptor, the uh, angiotensin converting enzyme 2 on the cell surface. Uh, and so we knew there were a lot of these out there, and we knew that coronaviruses in nature could spread by the respiratory route. However, since this was spread largely by the hospital and healthcare setting, uh, once it was controlled, we really sort of uh, forgot about what we had learned, which should have been a warning to us. Interestingly enough, about 10 years later, after SARS in 2003, we, another coronavirus sort of, I can't say reared its head, but if you're thinking about the fact that it might have come to us via camels in some cases, as has been suggested, uh, then maybe that's literally true. Um, the other coronavirus was in the Middle East and is called MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, caused by the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, naturally, uh, related to SARS, although on a slightly different branch of the family tree. It behaves very much like, like SARS. Um, and has a case fatality rate of actually a much higher than SARS, which was close, the original SARS, to, to about uh, 9%. This has a case fatality rate for symptomatic cases that go to um, medical attention of about 34% or so. It's still occurring. Most of the cases are in Saudi Arabia, as you can see here, and there are still cases occurring, almost all of them after the primary case, uh, through uh, breaches, as we would say, or lapses in infection prevention and control. And if you think it can't happen here, remember SARS in Toronto, where I thought, and I actually knew Don Lowe, who was the person in charge of, of the uh, hospital epidemiology there, and was very pained by the experience. But, you know, I think the infection prevention and control in Canada is certainly as good as uh, in the U.S., and probably I would venture to say, as I, I'll, I'll let Paul weigh in on that on a future occasion next year, next year perhaps, 
as good as anywhere in, in the world. So we mustn't get complacent because obviously there's still room for improvement. However, the Middle East has its challenges too, as you can see. Most of these cases are in the hospital or healthcare associated setting. And you can see this, this orange peak here. That was in the Republic of Korea in 2015, which made them very aware of their susceptibility to coronavirus outbreak. It was one individual who contracted MERS, a Korean business person, when, when he was in the Arabian Peninsula, came back home to Korea and spread it to all of these people. 185 cases with 36 deaths, all symptomatic, uh, in various parts of the country as he moved around from hospital to hospital and as um, exposed people infected people moved around from hospital to hospital. Um, all of them started by the one individual. So Korea became very aware of, of the problem of coronaviruses, perhaps much more than we had been because we thought it was you know, under control. And this, too, should have been a warning, even though it does not spread well from person to person, just like the original SARS, with some exceptions, close contact and so on, it spreads very readily in the healthcare associated setting, as you can see. And then we sort of uh, hit the snooze alarm for another 10 years, although it should have been a wake up call. I'm borrowing that, that phrase from a, a colleague. Um, and um, suddenly we're awakened in 2019, and especially in 2020, by the current pandemic SARS coronavirus 2, COVID 19. The first warning of this officially was from the WHO, a communique from uh, WHO on pneumonia of unknown cause, that's how they're usually phrased, uh, or, or something like that, um, on, in early January. Um, and uh, there should have been some red flags there to all of us, and I think probably to many uh, people in this field there were, because if you look at the last paragraph, this is slide 28. If you look at the last paragraph, which you find very quickly, is that there is a statement that there are, uh, to the best of their knowledge, although there are many cases, uh, 44 already with 11 severe cases, that's pretty worrisome, apparently uh, very quickly uh, occurring. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there was no evidence, they claimed, the, um, the Chinese uh, local, the local authorities, um, uh, claimed for either person to person or um, healthcare worker uh, infection. So that made, I think that should be a red flag. That made us all wonder, you know, what was going on, knowing the other coronaviruses and the possibilities with, with SARS and SARS like coronaviruses that were out there. I think many of us thought it was very likely to be spread person to person, since many of these cases were not occurring within the healthcare setting, but had come to the healthcare, uh, to the hospital to be treated, and, and therefore it was very likely to be uh, transmitted, very probably knowing coronaviruses, by the respiratory route, like a flu pandemic, essentially. And in fact, the world first was notified about this in another ProMed mail posting, um, uh, on the 30th of December, which um, WHO tells me actually alerted Geneva, their headquarters, to call the China country office and ask what was going on. Um, and that's when that communique came out. This is just a timeline, but shows how quickly it went in the first month. So in the first month, we uh, heard about this in China. It became very big uh, and widespread within Wuhan and the Hubei province. Please forgive my uh, not getting the correct tones in Chinese. Um, and, and then spread within the area. Uh, it was contained largely through very, uh, we would call draconian measures, but we took the same measures ourselves, or at least tried to, which China could enforce, of course, very strictly, you know, given the, the nature of, of their society and, and the severity of the threat. It was enforced very quickly and um, 
very strictly, but also they developed, they got the sequence fairly quickly within a couple of weeks, posted that, and had developed diagnostic tests and were putting all their resources to diagnostics. The first death in China was recorded on January 11th, and um, by a month after the original identification, January 31st, WHO had declared it a, an emergency of public health, a global uh, emergency of public health concern, or PHEIC, and uh, the U.S. closed airports. Um, and, and this simply shows the uh, illness of, of uh, on state of uh, onset and age distribution of patients with uh, what was then called uh, novel coronavirus 2019 in China. The earliest cases um, that we knew about were in early December, and we still don't exactly understand when or know exactly when the earliest cases were or where. This is slide 31. Um, so this was data from China, which I think in many ways was very helpful because it told us that uh, it could spread very rapidly. The cases were accruing very rapidly. And we should probably be thinking about human to human and very likely respiratory spread given the rapid uh, nature of this epidemic. And in fact, this was confirmed rather quickly by the WHO, which in the uh, third week in January made a field visit to Wuhan and confirmed that, in fact, the Chinese believed it was being spread by human-to-human -human transmission. Uh, and the WHO made a number of recommendations in early February, by which time we already understood not only that it was spread by the respiratory route, most likely, or at least got into people by the respiratory route, but that it could be spread asymptomatically or pre-symptomatically. I won't go into the details of how we found that out, but there were a number of pieces of evidence from China, from the WHO report, and from some, some other incidents that occurred in Singapore and elsewhere that indicated that, that people did not have to be symptomatic, unlike SARS-1, to be um, to be able to in, be infected and then spread the disease to others. And that was probably one of the biggest failings we had in our preparation for this. Slide 33 simply shows the situation as of February 28th. It looked like a tale of two countries, really. This enormous uh, epidemic or, or very um, concentrated big epidemic in China and a few spotty cases elsewhere. And so, you know, we thought, oh, this was a problem in China, and maybe something else we could close airports, which we, I'll show you why we don't recommend it. Um, and there were good reasons in this case why it might have worked if it had been done properly, but it was not, as usually the case, done as it should have been done. On the other hand, um, the... Uh, there were only a few cases. These were people with actual illness, however, not asymptomatic, because uh, a few countries in Asia had already developed and deployed Singapore, Taiwan, and a few other countries, as well as mainland uh, China itself, uh, had developed and deployed diagnostics to be able to screen as, as well as test diagnostically more definitively, uh, which takes longer, PCR tests, for example, but had some rapid screening tests that could be used to screen people. We had not yet done that, and that gap was one of our biggest failings, I think, in, in having that and implementing it worldwide. And so what had looked in January and February like a tale of two countries, China contained it through a lot of uh, surveillance and some rather harsh measures, um, the lockdowns we've become familiar with, very strictly enforced, whereas in other parts of the world, it had leveled off in China, but in other parts of the world, it was now climbing and continued to climb. By January 17th, the U.S. had already instituted, this is slide 35, had already instituted airport screening. This isn't uh, in the U.S., but it shows you basically how it was being done, but only really for symptomatic individuals. So we were missing all those asymptomatics uh, who we later realized retro 
respectively, were, were really the main source of um, spread of the infection. And we should have known it at the time. Those data were available. This is a U.S. airport. March 14th, March 13th is when New York City essentially shut down. And you can see the great attention to uh, infection control as people were screened at this airport. They were coming back from places like China. These were mostly, but not entirely, U.S. citizens who were allowed back into the country. That's a constitutional right. Um, but they weren't really screened. Their temperatures were tested, and if they didn't have a fever or they didn't say they had just been in Wuhan, they were let go. They were allowed to go on. On the other hand, by then, as we already knew, this had spread beyond China. It was already in Europe and was probably introduced here at least once from Europe um, and also other places. And we knew or should have known that asymptomatics were an important source of spread, but here is a super spreader event in the airports. No masks, no distancing, no precautions. And so in an ironic way, our 21st century uh, response to the major pandemic um, in the 21st century very much resembles what we did, not non-pharmaceutical measures in the uh, 1918 pandemic, showing you how far we've gone. This is slide 37. I know go, go on to slide 38, which basically says that um, this is with flu, actually, where we think of people being symptomatic by and large, but uh, and not spreading. Uh, maybe in the pre-symptomatic stage they could, but that's not clear. And yet, even here, it was already known before. Um, this particular infection, the virus was named SARS coronavirus 2 by the official committee that makes these designations, but WHO had, get, had dubbed it COVID 19 to great confusion. So I, I like to reserve that for the clinical disease and SARS coronavirus 2 for the virus itself. And that's confused people when they talk about cases that are asymptomatic, but in fact turn out, you know, to be virus positive, and we really should differentiate them. But what this shows is that there are many asymptomatic, inapparent people who are infected, even with flu, for all of those people at the upper part of the pyramid who get medical attention and are more severely infected or more severely uh, affected or even possibly uh, may very tragically die or, or have other effects infection, like the so-called long COVID that we've come to become familiar with. So uh, the next slide just simply talks about our gap in surveillance and being able to deploy uh, appropriate uh, diagnostic and screening technologies. And I think that was our biggest failing overall. We simply did not have proper surveillance. And to this day, we do not. So that's slides 39 and 40. We never imagined how political this would come. This is slide 41, showing you know that it's really become a polarized issue. And ironically, in many different ways, including questions about its origin and many other things, which I, I think are really not questions we should be talking about now. We should be working on controlling this. Uh, this is slide 42, and I think we already know the number of cases. They had been up and up. That slide's 43, 44. And of course, the variants, which we might expect as the virus circulates, mutations occur in, within each of the hosts. And as the virus circulates, they're selected for. Simple Darwinian process. Uh, those that are most fit uh, win out the race and get selected for. And we've seen this happen over and over again. First, with one mutation, D614G, shown on slide 47, then another one, first identified in the UK, and then, of course, the Delta variant, which has been the um, predominant one. All of these simply are better fit. They're more tra they've been more transmissible so far than their predecessors. 
or their ancestors, if you will. And now we have a new one, Omicron, which seems to be even more transmissible. And, and in a sense, we've been lucky that these have not been more severe, but transmissibility, obviously, um, is something that would give them a fitness advantage and that we thought about a great deal um, and, and really should recognize you know, is, is probably going to be pretty much inevitable whenever we have the opportunity for variants to occur. What could have stopped this? What could have stopped this were good public health measures at the beginning, including screening at points of entry for infection, not just thinking that we needed to find and confirm the symptomatic cases who are likely to be hospitalized anyway. And then we were uh, testing. We were using our precious diagnostic tests on the symptomatic hospitalized people who basically were going to get symptomatic treatment early on. And, and really those tests should have been developed on a large scale to be used rapidly, and we're still only in the early stages of developing and rolling those out. They should have been out at the beginning, as they were in certain other countries, so that people could be tested when they entered and traveled, and those who were infected, uh, mostly asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, could be isolated um, and uh, prevented from infecting others. Um, or quarantined if we thought that they might be symptomatic, but um, but not, we weren't clear whether or not they were infected. Quarantine, as you know, is for people who are uh, not uh, known to be infected, but we wait and see. Isolation for those who are, um, who are infected, uh, to sort of wait it out so they can't pass it on to others. So that was really a big failing. We didn't recognize that that route of transmission, or we simply didn't have the tools to be able to do that. I, I think maybe the latter was the case. A lot of denial there, as usual. There's also an amazing lack of, of global and regional coordination, which I think is quite remarkable, considering that the WHO had done a tremendous job of coordination and um, getting communities, uh, various communities of practice together uh, in 2003 for the SARS, the original SARS epidemic, or uh, you could call it a pandemic if you like, um, but for the original SARS. And so as a result, you know, it's really baffling to many of us that even within Europe, for example, there was every country was on its own, every region was on its own. And of course, that was very clear in the United States and some other federal um, uh, governments. But it seemed to be true throughout the world, highly balkanized, if I may use the word, with a lack of coordination that could have helped a lot if we had had good surveillance and good planning. And, and unfortunately, we didn't have the supplies to do that. We also were not planning on the response of government leaders and others who would take advantage of this to spread mi misinformation. So there are many lessons we have learned from this. The question is whether we have really learned those lessons. Uh, because um, if this is, as it is now on the 2020 list, retrospectively at the top of our list when it was once only considered as a potential, it's now at the top of our disease X list, what is the next disease X? And was this really a dress rehearsal? And if so, with all these dress rehearsals, including 2009 H1N1, as well as this one, will we be prepared for the next one and take it seriously? Thank you for your time and attention. Uh, that's uh, slide 56. Um, Thank you for your time and attention. Congratulations. Thank uh, Paul. Thank you all for listening. A little bit over my time. I apologize, but I, um, I hope I, I got most of this in uh, within your, your whatever number of message units you're allowed. And happy holidays to everyone. Stay safe and, and keep up those non-pharmaceutical measures and vaccination. I do believe that that does help, even if it hasn't been the panacea. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much for that. And uh, don't worry about going over time. I could listen to you for hours. <laughs>
Yeah, um, you're very kind. <laughs> so I wanted to uh, certainly thank you for that. That was an excellent presentation. And I want to highlight again what you said about ProMed, and specifically ProMed Mail, that it is not funded by government organizations or, uh, or, or that sort of thing. It's funded largely by the people who use the system. And I, for one, make a donation to ProMed Mail every year. And I would encourage you, if you have not done so, if you get those emails telling you what's happening around the world, I would encourage you to make even just a small donation. It doesn't need to be a lot. It can be $20 or whatever you're able to provide. That makes a great deal of difference because that kind of funding is provided by only 1% or 2% of the people who use the ProMed Mail network. And if you're not using ProMed Mail, please consider registering for it. It's a very valuable asset. Uh, Stephen, do you have anything you. you want to say on, on that matter? No, thank you very much for those uh, kind words. I will say that when I left academe at Rockefeller and went to government at, at DARPA, I uh, dissociated myself officially from ProMed simply because, you know, we didn't want any appearance. I didn't want any appearance of, of any government uh, intervention casting a, a shadow on that because we are, you, you know, really don't want to have any appearance of bias from either governments or commercial sources. And that's very important to give people trust in the system. Trust is, I think, what's been lacking here as well with this pandemic. So thank you very much for highlighting that and for providing these wonderful educational opportunities for the last 20 years and I hope many years to come. Well, you're very kind. Thank you for that. I'll go to the next slide, number 58. It just highlights a few of the teleclasses that are pending for the next few weeks. Uh, the one on January 13th, we specifically scheduled that for uh, uh, to, to follow Stephen's lecture because it kind of follows on from this. It's One Health for Human Health Clinicians. In light of COVID-19, are we approaching a tipping point? I hope that you'll register for some or all of the 20, uh, 2022 teleclasses. There are some yet to be posted that are not there yet, but we'll get those as soon as we can. On the very last slide, our patron sponsors are listed. I'd like to acknowledge again Diversity, Virox, Gamma, Purell, and the World Health Organization. These folks do help to make teleclass education financially possible. It is not inexpensive to do what we do, and we serve the low- and middle-income countries, well, all of them, really, that we have membership in every country around the world, and most of the people in the world, those who are in low- and middle-income countries, pay absolutely nothing to participate in teleclass education. So that's possible because of our sponsors and because of you. Thank you all for joining us this year. Uh, Stephen, I wish you all the best for happy holidays, as I do for all of our members, and we will talk again very soon. Goodbye, and thank you again. Thank you very much. Happy holidays.